I hope everyone is having a good morning. It's a lovely day here in London. Nice view. So if you, if you find the talk too boring, you can just look out the window. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and so, okay, this is the power of composition. Um, my name is Scott Voloshin. I have a website, fsharpforfunandprofit.com, which is uh, an F-sharp site, as you can guess. Um, do consulting with F-sharp Works if you need F-sharp consulting. So this talk is for beginners in FP. So if you already know what a monad is, you're going to find it kind of boring. If you don't know what a monad is and you're very scared about monads and you're freaked out by monads, then this is the right place to be because I will basically start from scratch. I will assume you know nothing about functional programming. And at the end, it will get kind of complicated. But um, the point is that I just want to introduce you to some of the concepts and I don't expect you to remember everything. There's no way you can remember everything. But hopefully just demystify stuff so that when you see it next time, it's like, oh, rather than thinking of it scary, you say, okay, I remember that. It's, it's not, not as weird as I thought it was, and I can actually make an effort to understand it. So I'll be using F-sharp examples. Um, but this is really a conceptual talk. <laughs> These are about concepts. So you can do this in pretty much any programming language, except maybe COBOL or something. But you can certainly do it in C Sharp and Java and JavaScript and so on. <clears throat> so here's the overview of the talk. Um, we'll start off by talking about the philosophy of composition when, and what does it even mean to <coughs> do composition. Composition is something that when I first got into functional programming, people would talk about it all the time. And I never quite knew what they meant. I thought I knew what they meant. And I think, well, why is it such a big deal? Um, and so that's really, I thought I'd do this talk really to explain to myself when I was learning why is composition such a big deal, why is it such an important concept, and why do functional programmers go on and on and on about it all the time. Um, and then I'll talk about functional programming <coughs> principles. So this is just the basic stuff about what functional programming is from a kind of completely non-technical point of view, <coughs> um, which is basically functions and how to compose them and types and how to compose them. And this is typed functional programming, so this is F-sharp, OCaml, Haskell, it's not Clojure or JavaScript. But the concepts are very similar. Then we'll talk about composition in practice. Um, I'm going to go through a bunch of examples, and each one's going to demonstrate something about composition. So we'll do some simple examples first, and then we'll do FizzBuzz, carbonated FizzBuzz, which is a really complicated version of FizzBuzz, and I don't really recommend you actually do FizzBuzz this way, but I just to demonstrate the principles, of course. Um, and then we'll do in a web service, and we'll see how these composition principles apply to all of these things. Okay, so the prerequisites for this talk. I'm assuming you want to learn functional programming, and so I have some recommendations. You need to have a beginner's mind. You need to forget everything you know. You need to pretend that you've never seen any of this stuff before. I think that will be really helpful. Um, and in particular, you need to forget everything you know about object-oriented programming. You need to forget about loops, you need to forget about variables, you need to forget about objects. Um, if you try and bring your OO concepts into learning, you'll, you'll get very frustrated. you say, well, how do I do a loop? And how do I do an object? And how do I do you know, a, a mutable variable? It's like, just forget those things even exist, and your life will be a lot easier. Just start from scratch. So it's a little test for you. Are you ready to learn functional programming? OK, now you must pass this test before carrying on with this talk. Otherwise, you're going to have to leave, I'm afraid. OK, here's the test. What is a class? OK. What is a method? And what is a for loop? What's inheritance? OK. Think about these questions. OK. Ready? Here's the answers. What is a class? I don't know. That's the, that is the correct answer. What is a method? No idea. OK. What is a for loop? Can't tell you. What is inheritance? Search me. OK. So those are the correct answers to those questions. And just, how did you do? I hope you got them all right. If you didn't get them all right, you need to try again. OK. <laughs> Come back and do it later. <clears throat> all right. So let's talk about philosophy for a second. Um, here's the things you need to know in order to understand uh, composition. First of all, you need to have been a child at some point. I hope all of that applies to all of you. Everyone was, hopefully was a child. You have to play with Lego, and hopefully you have to play with the toy trains, or at least had a friend who had toy trains. <clears throat> and in fact, that first thing, you don't need to have been a child at some point, because actually there are a lot of adults who like playing with Lego too. If you Google AFOL, you will find a lot of adults who are really obsessed with Lego. 
Adult, adult friends of Lego, I think. Right, <clears throat> so let's start with Lego. Hopefully everyone knows about Lego. This is a great ad from the 70s. Um, Lego philosophy. Lego has a philosophy. And the philosophy is that all pieces are designed to be connected. Uh, that if you connect any two pieces together, you get another piece, another Lego piece that you can connect to other pieces, right? You can still connect them together once you've connected two of them together. And the pieces are reusable in different contexts. So here's an example, here's some pieces. They're all designed to be connected, they all have the little dots on, right? Every single Lego piece has a thing on it. And when you start gluing them together, if you I take the first piece and the second piece, um, in, in a glue, I have another thing and I can keep adding things to it. I don't have to stop just because I've connected two things. I can just keep adding and adding and adding, okay? You don't need to create a special adapter to connect two pieces of Lego together. You just connect them together. You don't have to like create a little container to put them in, all right? You just like stick them together straight away. Very, very easy. It's why it's so easy to play with Lego. And because this is a very important thing, because when you add them together, you get another thing of the same kind, you can keep going and going and going. So there's, there's no limit to how big your Lego can be. Now you can see where I'm going with this when I'm talking about programming, but this is just your sneak preview here. So here's the reusable thing too. You can, take it, you can put them together in one way, you can take it apart and put them together another way. Reuse, Lego's reusable, okay. Why is it reusable? Um, <clears throat> it's because each piece is self-contained and there are no strings attached, literally, there are no strings attached to Lego. So it means they don't get tangled up. You know, if you, if you had put two pieces together and you had to wire them together and you couldn't you reuse one with having a special kind of wiring or something, that's not reusable. Legos are reusable because they are completely self-contained. They have no dependencies on the outside world. Each piece is an isolated piece. It's very important. Right, so this thing of keeping adding and adding and adding and making bigger things, this is what you end up with. You end up with giant pieces <coughs> of Lego. <clears throat> and this is a piece of Lego too. You can keep on adding to this, right? You can, it's just got little things on it you can add to it. So that's what I call the power of composition. That's my slogan for this talk. The power of composition compels me to tell you this. So, <clears throat> all right, let's look at another philosophy, which is wooden railway tracks, as in Brio or something. Okay, all the pieces are designed to be connected. If you connect two railway tracks together, you get another railway track. <coughs> and the pieces are reusable. All right. Here's some railway track. They're designed to be connected. Right? Everyone has a little thing on them. <coughs> when you connect two pieces, if you take two pieces of track, you put them together, you've got now a kind of bigger piece of track that you can keep adding to other pieces. Okay, this is obvious. Right? It's really obvious how this works. I don't know why, you know, it, somehow it doesn't seem to be obvious when we're doing programming, but it's really obvious when we're doing Lego and, you know, this stuff. You don't need a special adapter to stick railway tracks together. Don't need, and actually, they do sell special adapters for when you haven't got enough of a certain kind of piece, but, you know, in general, you don't need special adapters. Which means you can keep adding and adding and adding, and you can make, um, you know, okay, make big ones. Reusable, again, you can take them apart, reuse them in different situations. You can have a special, you know, points track, and you can have a little bridge piece, and you can use that bridge in other little things, which is kind of cool. <coughs> okay. And you can keep going and going and making bigger and bigger pieces if you need to. And that's the power of composition as well. All right, so Lego philosophy, railway track philosophy, <coughs> very, very similar. All right, now let's talk about something that you probably have heard of, which is Unix philosophy. So I stole this from the Wikipedia page from Unix, so hopefully it's right, because I trust Wikipedia to be always 100% accurate. Um, Number one, write programs that do one thing well. And if you want to do a new thing, you build a new piece. You don't complicate old things by adding new features. You build a new piece. You, never, you don't modify old code. You design the programs to work together. So you expect that the output of your program is going to be the input to some other program that you don't have even written yet, or you don't even know what it is. And you write programs to handle text streams because text streams are the universal interface on Unix. Now, it's maybe not so universal, but I, you know, I can see where they're getting, where they're, where they're trying to, to get at here. So this matches very well to our composition philosophy. You've got reusable people. Each piece is a single thing which is reusable. It only does one thing. They're designed to be connected. They're designed to work with each other. 
and you don't need to have a special adapter. You can use the universal TypeScript interface to connect your uh, components together. <coughs> right. So that is the philosophy behind computation. Now let's look at functional programming and see how that philosophy applies to functional programming. So again, I'm going to assume you know nothing about functional programming, and I'm sorry if you do, because this will be a bit boring. So core principles of functional programming, and this is my theory of functional programming. People have different ideas. But here's, two, here's the three things. First of all, functions are things, and I'm going to think of them as a little bit of railway track. Uh, use composition everywhere. And again, that's like Lego. And that types, and you're doing type functional programming, types are not the same thing as classes. Uh, they're much more like sets. And we'll talk about all of these, thing, three, these three things. So first principle, functions are things. So in functional programming, I like to think of a function as a little bit of railway track that transforms inputs into outputs. And there's a little tunnel of transformation on there. And something goes in one end, and it comes out the other end different. Um, in this case, the apple goes in one end, and a banana comes out the other end. And we write that in, <coughs> in coding. We write that as apple, arrow, banana. Apple is the input, and banana is the output. Okay, So there is a function. Now, it's really important that a function is a standalone thing. It's not attached to a class. And that means it can be used as inputs and outputs for other functions. And when I say standalone, that's really another word for a reusable component. I can take this function in isolation and reuse it in many different contexts, which I couldn't do if it was a method, for example, in the class. So here is a function which has an output. So the function has an input, and the output is one of these fruit functions. Or here is a function, and here is an input. So it's got a function as an input. Or here's another function with an input and an output, and here it's got another function as a parameter. Okay, to control how the input is turned into the output. So functions as input, functions as output, functions as parameters. <coughs> you can build really complex systems. It's, that's the basic principle. And from that, just like with the Lego and the railway track, you can build really complex systems because functions that return functions that generate functions and so on and so forth. It can get really complex, but the fundamental principle is very straightforward. All right, second principle, composition everywhere. So here is a piece of railway track. Here's another piece of railway track. Um, how do I compose them together? Well, just like with the toy trains, I just take the two things together and I mush them together and I get a new piece of track. <clears throat> so now we have a new function composed from the two smaller functions. Now what's interesting about this function is that you cannot tell that it was built from smaller functions. Unlike with a railway track where you can see there's a seam, with a function, you can't. there's no seam. You can't tell that it was made from smaller pieces. And that's really cool because you don't know how it was made. In this particular case, there was a banana, but the bananas disappeared. Okay, where did the banana go? Right? The fact is the banana is now hidden. You've now kind of got an abstraction. So the fact that banana was important at the low level, when you've got this higher level function that you want to show people, this is your public API. The public API doesn't talk about bananas. So that is kind of cool. All right, so let's look at some code. Uh, let's say we've got an add function, add one function, a double function. We want to glue them together. So this is F sharp code. So F sharp, you define a function saying let. Uh, if anyone does Python, it's F sharp looks really, really like Python, except instead of saying def, you say let. Okay. So there's a double function, which is plus uh, x plus x. And also um, in F sharp, you don't have a return keyword. The, the value, the last, the return value is the last thing in the in the definition. So in this case, it just returns x plus x. So to make a new function, I just add take add one and I mush it together with double, and um, <coughs> that double angle bracket is the composition symbol. So I got a new function, add one then double, and I can just call it with a number like five, just like it was a regular function. And the answer is 12. In fact, it's not just like a regular function. It is a regular function. OK? So that angle angle is the composition operator in F sharp. In other languages, it's different. In Haskell, it's just a period. Um, different languages might have different symbols for that. Here's another one. We've got three functions. We want to glue them together. 
Okay, we just take all three functions and we mush them together with the composition operator, and then we've got a new function and we can just call it with five. And we get, in this case, we get 144. Add one, then double, then square. So hopefully this is kind of really obvious. It's very straightforward. <coughs> if you've played with railway tracks, you should totally understand how this works. Now in F sharp, we actually use another technique, uh, as in, in more so than comp than that kind of angle bracket thing, which is the piping. This is very much like Unix piping. Um, so, here's the problem. If, you, if you're doing a traditional language with parentheses, you might say, well, I want to add one to five, and then I want to double it, and then I want to square it. Now, each time you do that, you, you put it in deep inside parentheses. You put parentheses around and then do something <coughs> on the outside and do parentheses. The, the, the thing you want is buried right in the middle of the parentheses. So you have to read it from the inside out. Okay, so you say, well, I want to start with add one, and then I want to double it, and then I want to square it. And it's a little bit confusing when you have all these parentheses. So uh, this is you know, what you used to in, in C Sharp or Java or something, but in functional programming, in F Sharp especially, we like to use the piping model. So it's the same thing. You start with five, you feed it into the add one function, you take the output of the add of that function, which is six, you feed it into the double function, you take the output of that function, you feed it into the square function. So it's very much like the Unix piping model. And I think this is a lot easier to understand because you don't have this nested parentheses. You just start from the left and you kind of work your way across. <clears throat> so this is how it looks in F sharp. Five, you pipe it into add one, or you pipe it into add one and take the output and pipe it into double, or you take it, you know, start with five, pipe it into add one, take the output of add one, pipe it into double, take the output of double, pipe it into square. And in F sharp, the pipe symbol is a vertical bar with an angle bracket because the vertical bar actually used for something else, but it's very similar to the Unix model of piping. Okay, so we're going to be seeing a lot of piping. It's, like, it's the main way of doing stuff like this in F sharp. So, building bigger things from functions. Okay, it's compositions all the way up. It's not turtles all the way down. It's compositions all the way up. So, we start with a low-level operation, for example, like uppercasing a string. That's a function. It's got a string input, string output. Now, to make something bigger, we take a bunch of these low-level operations, we compose them somehow, and we get, say, a service, an address validation service. And in this case, the input's an address, and the output is some sort of result. And uh, for people who are under 30, you might not know what a service is. Uh, it's basically just like a microservice, but without a service. <laughs> anyone over 30, anyone who's programmed in the 90s knows what a service is, but nowadays, I don't think anyone does. Okay, so we've got these services. Um, we glue those together into a use case or a scenario, workflow, whatever you want to call it. In this case, updating some customer data. So you've got an input, which is a request. You've got an output. And these are all the use cases. And then you take these use cases and you build them into, you com compose them into a web application. And the way you do that, so web application has a, a request as an input and a response as an output. And inside the web application, there's a dispatcher, a router, a controller, whatever you want to call it, that decides which one of these use cases to call based on the request. All right? Composition all the way up. It's kind of fractal. What's nice is you're using exactly the same techniques at the bottom as you are at the top. All the way, you know, so it's, you're just using one kind of unified principle. Okay, so you end up, if you look inside your web application, it's going to look like this, a whole bunch of functions glued together. The power of composition. Okay, and we'll actually see an example of this at the end of the talk. So, power of composition, power of composition. I think you get the, the, the message. I'm kind of emphasizing it very heavily here. Composition is good. All right. There's more kinds of composition you can do as a functional programmer, and this is where some of the jargon comes in. Monoids. Okay, so monoids is a jargony word, it's a mathematical word. Um, it's really a way of composing things like strings, lists, um, even integers and stuff. It's a, it's, a, it's a technique for doing composition of things like that. Um, monads is another jargony word, which we will be talking about later. Uh, and that's for composing functions which have effects. And we'll, I'll show you that when we get to fizzbuzz. And finally, there's category theory, which functional programs are very kind of obsessed with category theory. And the reason is because category theory is sort of composition theory. It's really about how do you do composition? If you compose this thing with this thing, is that the same as composing this thing, other thing? Um, 
that's what I'm going to say in this talk. If you're a mathematician, please close your ears and pretend I never said that. <coughs> but uh, from a sort of functional program point of view, that's why people are interested in category theory. All right, another principle. Types are not classes. So they're more like sets. So what is a type? Okay, it's a kind of set. If you have a function, you have a set of valid inputs for the function, and you have a set of valid outputs for the function. So the type is just the name for that set. That's all the type is. It's not a class, it's just a name for a set of things. So if you say the set of valid inputs is all the possible integers, we call that type integer. Uh, if the set of valid outputs is all the possible strings, we say that is of type string. Uh, if it's all the possible people in the world, we say it's type person. Uh, if it's all the possible fruits, you say it's type fruit. Okay. Now, because it's a set, it can contain any group of things, including a set of functions. So you can have a set of functions as outputs or inputs, and we get, have that set has a name. In this case, is the set of fruit to fruit functions, functions that turn fruit into fruit. And so this would have the type. If we type fruit arrow fruit, that would be the name of that type. Okay, that's something that's when it start, your head starts spinning a little bit, but it's really, really important thing to understand. Okay, <coughs> composition everywhere. Types can be composed, or well, at least these kinds of types can be composed. And the reason is, oh, so yeah, so this, uh, the kind of type system that F Sharp and Haskell and other functional programming languages have is called an algebraic type system, a bit more jargon. If you forget about algebraic and call it a composable type system, it makes more sense, okay? It's a composable type system. And uh, it's composable because you build new types from smaller types, just like any other kind of composition. And there's actually two different ways you can build bigger types. You can compose them with and, and you can compose them with or. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, this kind of composition, by the way, is only possible because it's just data. Okay, it's just like sets. You can have a set intersection and set union and set subsetting stuff. There's, it's, it's doable because there's no data. If these kinds of things had methods attached to them, it would be really hard. So the very fact that the, set, the types are just data means it's really easy to compose them. Okay, so let's start with anding things together. So here's an example. Let's say you want to make fruit salads, and you say, well, I have an apple and a banana and a cherry. That's what makes up my fruit salad. Um, and this is a very familiar thing. Any programming language has this kind of stuff. It's a pair, it's a tuple, it's a record, it's a struct, whatever you want to call it. Uh, here's an example in F-sharp. You say type fruit salad equals, and it's an apple and a banana and a cherry. And it looks, it, this curly braces, it looks kind of like JavaScript or TypeScript or whatever, you know. Um, and that's a record type in F-sharp. Okay, so that's something you will be familiar with already. But the other way of doing it is a bit more unusual if you're not used to functional programming. It's composing with or. And so let's say I want a snack, and I'm going to have an apple or a banana or a cherry. That's my snack. Um, and like I say, this kind of oring things together is not available in languages you're used to unless you're a functional programmer. And in F sharp, you write it like this with a vertical bar, or, for, for, for Boolean or. Okay? It's an apple or, it's a banana or, it's a cherry. This is a really, really useful type. So I call this a choice type. The technical term in F-sharp is discriminated union. Um, you can also call them sum types, and if you're really fancy, you can call them co-products. Uh, I like to call them a choice type because from a modeling point of view, that's what I think of them. They're a choice between these three things. So let's look at a real-world example of composition. Okay, so here's a real-world thing. I need to accept payments for my business. Um, Let's say we take three forms of payment. We take cash, check, or credit card. For cash, we don't need any extra information. For checks, we need a check number. For credit cards, we need a credit card type and a credit card number. And I'm going to have to change this example because in the future, checks are kind of going out of fashion. But anyway, I'll replace it with PayPal or, or Bitcoin or something. OK, so how would you implement this in your language of choice? Well, if you're an OO programmer, you'd probably immediately say, well, I need a, an interface to represent the payment method, maybe an abstract base class, I don't know, 
Um, and then I'm going to have a bunch of subclasses or classes that implement this interface, a cash class, a check class, a credit card class, and each class is going to have the extra data it needs to represent that thing. Okay, well, that's fine. But let's look at how you do this in f -shot. So we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to start with an interface. We're going to build up the thing using composition. So we're going to start off with some primitives. We'll say we've got a check number and we've got a card number. Okay, those are our primitives. And we've got some, these are just aliases for a primitive to make our code look nicer. Okay, once we've got a check number and a card number, um, we can say, well, the card type is it's either Visa or MasterCard. Okay, and then we have credit card information, which is going to be the card type and the card number. Okay, so the Visa or MasterCard, that's a choice. Okay, so that's a choice type. And the credit card information is a card type and a card number. So that's an and type, using as a record type. Okay, next, let's do our payment method. So a payment method is cash or check or credit card. And in each case, we have the extra information. There's no extra information with cash. For check, there's a check number. For card, the extra information is credit card info. That's choice type, right? And it's a choice with the vertical bars. It's one of those three things. And we can keep going. So we say, OK, a payment amount is a decimal. A currency is euros or dollars, OK? Another primitive and another choice type. And then we can keep going. We say, well, a payment is an amount and a currency and a payment method. And now this is an and, this is a record type, OK? So what we've done here is we've built up the final type by composing smaller types over and over and over, building a big thing from a small thing, okay? <coughs> the power of composition. Um, what's nice is it's very compact. It fits in one page very nicely. So this is another nice thing about um, functional programming is we tend to use types as executable documentation. They're not just something that gets in the way. They're something that actually documents what you're doing. So if I show you something like this, <clears throat> um, can you guess what I'm talking about here? I'm talking about, you know, a card game of some kind, right? Um, these are all the different types in the card game, and it fits on one page. It pretty much describes everything I'm doing with the card game. Now, these are nouns, but you can also have verbs, i.e. functions. So to deal is you start with a deck uh, of cards, and then you take one of the cards out, and you put it on the table, and you've got a new deck left back. That's a function that, you know, starts the deck and emits a new thing. So you can do, you can represent nouns, you can represent verbs. Okay? Very cool that you can fit the entire domain on one screen. Um, here's the one we just looked at, payment method. If I come to you and I'm just trying to maintain your code, or let's say you're trying to, main, you're trying to maintain my code, and, I, you know, can you guess what all the different payment methods are? If, if you, you've got a code to maintain and someone says, what different payment methods do we take? Well, if you have the OO thing, you might have to look in five different files. In this one, they're literally on the same page, and the, you know, the same four lines, they're right next to each other. So from a document, <coughs> documentation point of view, this is very, very nice. So this is a massive topic. I don't have enough time. I have a whole talk about this. If you're interested in domain-driven design and types, I have a talk at slash DDD on my website. And I have a book coming out called Domain Modeling Made Functional, which you can all rush out and buy, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> OK, next. Think of a number. So we're going to start now with a very simple example of basic composition. Think of a number. Think of a number, add 1 to it, square it, subtract 1, divide by the number you first thought of, subtract the number you first thought of, and the answer is 2. OK, this is kind of a child's, you know, little fun game. OK, how are we going to implement this using composition? Well. We're going to have a little bit of railway track for each step, and we're going to glue them together. So we're going to add one, and we'll take the output of that, and we're going to subtract one. We'll take the output of that and square it, and the output of that, and divide by the number we first thought of, and so on and so forth. Okay? It, it naturally maps the composition model, which is why I picked this example. So let's look at the code. We're going to define a function for each step. We'll define an add one function, a square it function, a subtract one function, a divide function, and subtract another one. We define define all these helper functions. And once we've defined all these helper functions, and by the way, don't worry about understanding the syntax too much. I just want to kind of show you that you define all these helper functions, and then you combine them. So we take the number you first thought of, we pipe it into add one, we pipe it into square, 
we pipe it into subtract one, we pipe it into divide by the number of those, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is the composition principle applied to this particular problem. Okay, so the code is kind of elegant. Notice there's no classes, there's no methods, it's all functions. All right, that's a very simple example. Hopefully, this all makes sense. And like I say, if you need to look at these slides, I'm, gonna, I'm going very, very fast. I will put the slides up on my website so you can review them later on. All right. Somehow, it's not always that easy. You know, it's like I've made it look really easy. No, it's not always that easy. So we, we, what we've been talking about so far is functions where you can just literally compose them and it works first time. Yeah, if, as if. So here's the problem. <clears throat> um, let's say you have a function with two outputs. Okay, like this one. Some functions actually have more than one output. Here's another function. Some functions have more than one input. Okay, and what happens then is they can't be composed. If you have two outputs and one input, how do you even compose these things? Okay, or if you have one output and two inputs, how do you even compose them? Okay, so this is a problem, and this is what functional programmers actually spend most of their time doing is manipulating things so they can be composed. Um, not the functions, writing the functions themselves is pretty straightforward, but manipulating them so they can be composed, that's the kind of, it's like, it's like playing Tetris, you know, you have to like twist things around and stick them back in. So let's look at an example of why we do this, uh, uh, one example of how this might work. So Roman numerals, this is another simple problem. To make something into Roman numerals. So this is our task, we have an integer. Now, the Roman numerals means if it's a 5, we replace it with a V. If it's a 10, we replace it with an X, and so on, right? Now, the algorithm we're going to use is based on the fact that Roman numerals is a tally system. Um, so, in the old days, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4. When you got four of them, you put a strike through, and that would be your 5. And notice that that kind of <coughs> looks like a V. It's probably where the V came from, and so on and so forth. So, our algorithm is going to be a very crude, but very effective algorithm, which is... We start with, you know, if we're doing, you know, we're turning 25 into number, we create 25 slashes, okay? 25 ones. And then, if there's five ones in a row, we replace it with a V. And if there's two Vs in a row, we replace it with an X. And if there's five Xs in a row, we replace it with an L, and so on and so forth, up to M. That works out really well. It's a really easy algorithm to understand, and it's a lot less complicated than some of the stuff I've seen on the internet. All right. So, and I've also chosen this algorithm because it's very composable. Let's look at this replace function. We're going to be replacing ones with x's, you know, ones with v's and v's with x's. This replace function is going to be used a lot. Let's have a quick look at it. So the replace function has an input string, an old value, and a new value. And the output is, is the new output <coughs> string. So that's a three-parameter function, all right? So the problem is, when we want to replace the one by the v, and the v by the x and the x by the l, we can't glue them together. We can't glue them together because they just doesn't work. All right. So this is our problem. How can we solve this problem? So this is a more general problem, which is all these nice composition patterns of gluing things together. It works really well when every function has one parameter, right? But these functions don't have one parameter. So that's bad news. The good news is that you can actually turn every function into a one-parameter function. That's a very cool thing that functional programming allows you to do. And that is thanks to this guy, Mr. Haskell Curry. Uh, the technique of doing this thing is called currying, named after him. So this is something you might have heard of, currying. What is currying? So here is a very simple function with two parameters. Okay, it's an uncurried function. And what we're going to do is after currying, we're going to turn it into a function, a one-parameter function, with, say, the A input, and it's going to spit out a new function, a new kind of intermediate or temporary function. And that temporary function is also a one-parameter function, and that has the extra input B. All right, so currying is the, the technique of taking a multiple, a multi-parameter function and turning it into a series of one-parameter functions. And what's great about that is then these one-parameter functions can be composed. All right. <coughs> now, in F-sharp, you get currying for free. In other languages like JavaScript, you actually have to do some work to get currying to happen, but this is why currying is so important, because it makes everything into a one-parameter function. So this is the function before currying, and here's the code. I'll just show you the F-sharp code. It's a three-parameter function 
we have the old value, the new value, and the input string. And .NET already has uh, a replace method, but it's a method on, a, on the string class. So we're just going to call that method, but we're just going to make this into a, a nice uh, function that we can use. Okay, so this is how you'd call it in uh, C sharp, replace, input string dot replace. Now after currying, the code is going to look like this. It's now a two-parameter function, and it returns a lambda. And in, lam in F sharp, lambdas are written with a fun keyword, because it's a lot of fun to write lambdas. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, it's a function, so we're returning a lambda. The lambda has one parameter input, and it does this replace the whole value here. So the output, we now have a one-parameter function. The output is a one-parameter function which we can compose. And the old value and the new value are sort of baked in, like that. So this brings us to the next te technique. After we've done the currying, we can do partial application. So partial application means passing in some of the parameters, but not all of the parameters. And what, what we're left over is a function that's kind of missing some parameters. We can then provide those parameters later on. So it, it's important not to mix up partial application and currying. Currying is the process of turning functions into one parameter functions. Partial application is the process of passing in some but not all of the parameters, baking them in so that you can then use that function later on. So it's a really important technique. So here, for example, if we do replace five ones with a v, we're going to call the replace function um, with two parameters, not three. Okay, And that will give us a function back that we can then use later on. And if we're going to replace two v's with an x, that will we call replace with two out of the three parameters, we're missing a parameter that will be used later on, so we get a function back. Okay, So it, you can see it's partial, uh, uh, it's partial application, we're only passing in two out of the three parameters. And, and the, the, after we've got the function back, the, the old and the new stuff is sort of baked in, so we can now use it. Okay, so once, once we've done this partial application, we can now chain them together. So let's look at the code for that. Define a helper function, which uses partial application, another helper function, another helper function, another helper function, and so on and so forth. And then we can do our pipeline. So we start by replicating it, the, the, the I, and then we do the replace, and 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 so on and so forth. Okay? So that's very straightforward. <coughs> now, rather than writing helper functions all the time, we typically don't bother to do that. There's a lot of extra code. We normally use inline partial application. So, for example, here if we have an add function and a multiply function, you know, add function takes two parameters, but in the example below, we're just passing in one. We're saying add two, okay, and we're missing the extra parameter. That extra parameter will be provided later on through the pipeline. <coughs> and same with multiplying by two, multiplying by two what? You know, again, the extra parameter will be provided later on. And we can kind of do nested inline application like this. So in this case, we've started with a list of numbers, 1 to 10. We're going to map each of those numbers using add2, and then we're going to map each of those numbers using multiply. So map transforms things. So map is a two-parameter function. It has a, a function to transform each element and then the list itself. Well, I'm passing in the transformation function, but I'm not passing in the list. So I'm partially <coughs> appl applying map, and again, I'm partially applying add. So this is a partial application within partial application. So if we use partial application in our Roman numerals thing, we don't need to write these helper functions. We can just literally write them in line. Replace 5 with v, replace 2 v's with x, and so on. So you, 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 very rarely would you actually bother to write these uh, special helper functions. You just use the partial application like this. OK. Now what's cool about using this composition model is it's really easy to add new segments <coughs> to the pipeline. Um, for example, we haven't done, you know, four, four ones in a row is a 1v. So we can just keep going. We say we'll replace v1111 with 1x, we'll replace four ones with 1v, and so on and so forth. And this is this, when we go back to the unit philosophy, don't change the original code, add new things on. So with the pipeline model, it's really nice. You can insert new segments, you can append new segments, but you're not messing with the original code. So that's why another this is why this particular composition approach is so nice. So there you go. That was this particular challenge. How do we compose a function with two inputs? The answer is we use partial application. 
All right, next, FizzBuzz. <coughs> okay, for people who aren't familiar with FizzBuzz, it's another child's game. Um, write a program that prints the numbers from 1 to 100, <coughs> but if it's a multiple 3, print Fizz. If it's a multiple 5, print Buzz. If it's a multiple 15, print FizzBuzz. Okay, I'm sure you've all seen this. And most people would probably write an implementation like this. It's very simple. If it's divisible by 15, print FizzBuzz. If it's divisible by 3, print Fizz and so on and so forth. So this is the imperative solution, okay? Uh, and we're going to use this little helper function, is it divisible by, just to make the code look a bit nicer. So this is fine, this is the easy way of doing FizzBuzz, and I really wouldn't recommend making it any more complicated if you're doing a programming interview. But since this is a talk, let's make it more complicated. <coughs> this is not complicated enough. It's also, from a functional point of view, there's things wrong with it. It's not, it's not composable. I can't connect this FizzBuzz to something else. Right? Because it's, just, it's a self-contained, it's a monolith, it's a mini monolith. Um, it's also mixing in I.O. and it's not pure, so there's printing out to the console. Functional programmers like to put I.O. at the front and the back of their functions, and in the middle you have a pure function that doesn't mess with the outside world. It makes it a lot easier to test and a lot easier to understand what's going on. So from that point of view, this is a bad implementation. All right. But, okay, we're going to do the pipeline model of FizzBuzz. Okay, so the pipeline model, we're going to have to handle the 15 case, we're going to handle the 3 case, the 5 case, and then we're going to have a, a last step where we handle the remaining cases. All right, just like all the other ones. So the question is, what are these handlers? How do we handle a particular number? Right. So if you think about it, a number comes in, and we have two choices. It can either be unprocessed, like 2 or 7 or 13. I'm going to call that uncarbonated. And, or the alternative is it could be processed, in which case I'm going to call it carbonated, like a fizz or a buzz, okay? We've got two choices. <coughs> so, if we think of that in the railway track model, it's a, you can think of it as like points or, or, or switches in the US. Um, you have an input and you have two different outputs, uncarbonated output and carbonated output, all right? So this is our railway model for this particular function. So let's look at the code. So we're going to define a type which represents the choice. It's a choice between carbonated and uncarbonated. If it's uncarbonated, there's an integer associated with that choice. If it's carbonated, there's a string associated with that choice. Okay, so this is our type. And it's a choice type. And then to actually carbonate something, um, we pass in the number to divide by the label or the whatever, and then the number. So if, if it's divisible by the divisor, then it's carbonated, and we use that label like fizz. And if it's not divisible, we would say it's uncarbonated. Okay, so that's the code. See, it's pretty straightforward code. The, the concepts are harder than the actual code itself. Oops, sorry. So I've got this idea from Rag and Walls. Reginald Braithwaite. So uh, if you think it's a terrible idea, uh, you can blame him. Actually, he was using us to demonstrate how not to do a programming interview. And I would agree, but it's kind of fun to see, to take it to its limits, see how far you can go. Right, <coughs> so if we say carbonate three with fizz, we get a carbonated fizz. If we pass in 10, it's not divisible by three, and so it's uncarbonated. If we pass in 10 and we carbonate it with a five, it is carbonated and we get a buzz. Okay, so that's how our little function works. So, okay, we've got our functions. How do we compose them? Okay, well, if it's uncarbonated, we want to call the next one down in the line. Uh, if it's carbonated, we want to bypass. We're basically done. If we hit fizz, we can skip the rest of the line, okay? So this is how we want to compose them. And if we have a whole chain of these things, we want to compose them all together. How would you compose them if they were real train tracks? Well, obviously, you can make it like that, okay? This is the two-track model of, of composition, or the two-track fizz buzz. Okay, I call this railway-oriented programming. I have a whole talk about this, if you're interested. It's a very silly name, um, but it's quite a useful concept. <coughs> okay, so one-track functions can be composed, because you just take the output of the input. Two-track functions can also be composed because you take each input to the, you know, each output to the next input. That works fine. 
Here's the problem. We have a one-track input and a two-track output, and they can't be composed. So let's look at an implementation of FizzBars, our first attempt. So we start by carbonating it with 15. Uh, if it is carbonated, we're done. We, get the, we use the string. If it's not carbonated, we go to the next step, which is 3. So we carbonate it with 3, and if it was carbonated, we're done. And if it's not carbonated, we go to the next step, which is 5. We try carbonating with 5, and if it's carbonated, we're done. If it's uncarbonated, we're finished. Now, this is really ugly code. I mean, this is fine. It's, it works, but it's really ugly. You don't want to be writing code like this. But there is a pattern here that we can look at and steal, okay? which is that every time we see an uncarbonated, we do something. So if it's carbonated, we stop. If it's uncarbonated, we continue. So if it's uncarbonated here, we do something. If it's uncarbonated, we do something. If it's uncarbonated, we do something. Okay, that's the pattern. So this is the pattern in, in code here. If it's carbonated, we're just done, we return the string. If it's uncarbonated, then we do something with that number. All right. And this is crying out to be turned into a function with a parameter. So let's write some code. We're going to call it if uncarbonated do. That's the name of our, our function. And if the, it's basically encapsulating that pattern. So if it's a carbonated string, we're going to leave it alone. Okay, we're going to keep passing it back to the end of the line. If it's an uncarbonated number, we're going to call a function, which is the next function in the chain. All right. So this is a function parameter. We always like to parameterize things. Um, and in functional programming, we use function parameters to parameterize things. Now, we call it f. We have no idea what this function is. We can't give it a name. So we typically use very short letters like f, because it's just a function. I have no idea what this function does. <coughs> okay, And there is me using this function. All right. So now, if we have this if carbonated do helper function, um, we can rewrite our code. So we, f we start by carbonating it. And then if uncarbonated, do the next bit, which is carbonate by 3. If it's still uncarbonated, we do the next bit, which is carbonate by 5. And then finally, we carbonate the remaining. And I've got a little helper function, which is basically, this is one is different, <coughs> because basically, if it's carbonated, we return the string. And if it's not carbonated, we cast the int into a string. So you can see, though, that we've, now we've got now a composable model. If I want to do 7, you know, I want to have another one. Um, I can just stick another one right into that pipeline. All right. If I want to, you know, change the order or something, I can do all sorts of cool things with this model. There's one other thing we need to talk about, which is loops. I said there are no loops. Okay. Loops are not composable. So we have a fizzbuzz that only works for num for individual numbers, and the the goal was to work with lists of numbers, and we can't pass a list of numbers into this function because it only takes single integers. <clears throat> okay. That's a problem. But we, we always have a solution, which is to use another function. In this case, we're going to use a transformer function that takes a function that works on individual numbers and transforms it into a function that works on lists. And that is the map function. So list.map is a transformer function that takes one kind of function and spits out another kind of function. It takes a function that works on normal things and, and turns it into a function that works on lists. So that's what list map is all about. And if you're using link in C sharp, that is select. Um, yeah. So now we can have a list input to this function and a list output. So the fizzbuzz code, the final version looks like this. <coughs> 1 to 100 is our thing. We take our fizzbuzz function and we use map to turn it into a function that works on lists. And then now we have a list of strings and we want to print them all, so we use list iter, which is the same as map except it just has no output. And that's the IO part. And the IO is now the end of the function. There's no IO in the middle of the function. And again, the fizzbuzz function itself, carbonate, if uncarbonated do, if uncarbonated do, and so on. So we've got this composable way of implementing fizzbuzz. <coughs> OK, the M word. Is there a general solution to functions like this? OK, and the answer is yes. It's monads. Monads is the answer to everything. In this particular case, bind is the answer. Bind all the things. Um, functional programmers like the word bind. They get very excited by that. So um, this is our general problem. This is not just with FizzBuzz, but we often have a situation where we have one track input, two track output, which is not composable. If we could turn it into a two track input and a two track output, that is composable. <coughs> so how do we convert from the before to the after? Okay. 
and that's what the bind function does. It's an adapter block, if you think about it. Um, there's basically an adapter block and there's a slot and you pass in your, your switch, your points function and the output is now a two track. So <coughs> the bind function is a function transformer. It transforms one kind of function into another kind of function. So if we talk about in, in, in the FizzBuzz, the bind was actually the if uncarbonated do. That was our bind function. So if we look about it, if we look, look at it, this one, the two track result is the uncarbonated or carbonated. If it's uncarbonated, we do the next function in the chain, right? And, we, and that gives us two track output. Um, if, it's uncarb if it's carbonated, we just bypass. So this is the FizzBuzz version of bind, okay? And there's a bind for all sorts of things. So this is a quick definition of a monad. A monad is it actually sounds complicated, but all it is is a data type, in our case the carbonation data type, and an associated bind function. In our case it was the if uncarbonated do. And some other very simple stuff just to make sure that everything works as expected, that you don't have weird behavior. And that's basically it. And a monadic function, which you might also hear, is basically one of these switch or points functions. And you use bind, you, you run into these a lot, and bind, the reason why bind is so important is the bind is a way of composing these things. So if we have tasks, here's another example. You have tasks or async or whatever you want to call them. <clears throat> you know, you do something, you wait for a result. When the task completes, you do the next one down the chain. When the task doesn't complete or something, you just skip, right? So it's a very, very similar situation, and you use a very, very similar solution. So you can call this a promise, a future, whatever you want to call it. So here's an example without using bind. We start a task. When it's finished, we call another function. We start when that's you know we start another task when that's finished we call another function when that's finished we call another function and so on and so forth really ugly code okay so if we create a bind for tasks which says when you're finished call this function with this f parameter okay take take the result that you get and call call it with an f once we have this bind the code looks a lot simpler we start a task and we pipe it into bind or the next task and then we bind the next task, and we bind the next task, and so on and so forth. So now we've got this kind of, instead of having this kind of diagonal pyramid of doom thing, which you get a lot, you now have a nice linear vertical model. Okay? So bind, you can see how bind is really, really nice. Sometimes you'll see bind written in a different way, which is a symbol, which is angle, angle equals. Uh, it's literally the same thing as the bind method just re rewritten to sort the parameters around. When you, when you use it this way, you can use it just like just like a nice composition of a pipe. It's kind of like a piping thing. So there you go. Right, and error generating functions. <coughs> um, we can use exactly the same technique. So let's say you have a web service and you have a request that comes in and you want to validate the request and canonicalize the email and then fetch an existing record, then update the record and so on and so forth. That's fine. There might be errors, okay? When you validate requests, you might, the names might be blank or something. Um, when you fetch an existing record, the, you might not find the record, you, you might get a database error. When you try and update, you might get an authorization error or a timeout or something. There's errors, okay? So your code is going to look something like this. The validation function might return an error, so it's going to be one of these monadic uh, points functions. When you canonicalize an email, like lowercasing it or something, stripping out, trimming blanks, that's always going to work. When you fetch a record, that might be an error. When you update a record, that might not return anything. Okay, it might be a kind of a void function, equivalent of a void function. How can you compose these functions? Okay, they don't they don't have the same shape. So we have all these transformer functions. We have map, we have bind, we have a t and map, and we basically go through some work to transform them into two tracks. And once we've transformed them all into two track functions, we can then glue them together. So that's what all these helper functions like map and bind are really important because they, they allow you to transform stuff into things that can be composed. All right? So getting composition to work is like the number one priority when you're doing functional programming. <clears throat> all right, next one, and I'm running a little bit behind, I'm sorry. Last one, which is something else called Clisley composition. Okay, so we have these monadic functions, these points functions. We saw that we turned them into two-track functions. But there's another way of doing, doing it, which is to combine two of them into another points switch monadic function. Okay, you can just add them together and get another one of the same type. Now, what's cool, when it's the same type of thing, 
you can keep going, you can keep adding and adding and adding, just like the Lego, just like the railway track. If it's the same kind of thing, you can keep adding to it. So there's a web library for F-sharp called Suave, suave.io, uh, and it has a concept called a web part. Now, a web part is one of these monadic functions. The input is an HTTP context, which is a wrapper which contains the request, it contains the response, it contains the cookies, it contains the credentials, whatever, all the stuff you need to know to process a web request. <coughs> the output is an async HTTP context option. So it's async because everything should be async, and it's an option because you might not handle it. You might say, you know, this is the kind of request I can't deal with, so I'm actually not going to return anything. Right? So it might fail. This is the way you can tell it's going to fail. And you can read all about it on the Suave site. So you can compose two web parts to make another web part. And the composition symbol is the angle equals angle, another weird symbol. This is the standard symbol for Kleisley composition. Um, but again, when you combine these two things, you get another thing of the same type, which means you've got another web part, and now you can com combine some other web parts to make another web part, and so on and so forth. So let's look at actual, uh, uh, some real examples. So here is uh, composing two web parts. So path, hello, path is a web part that you pass in a string. And if it matches the path, it succeeds, and if it doesn't match the path, it fails. And OK is a web part that returns the OK response with this particular message. So I'm going to glue them together using Kleisley composition and get a new web part. And the web part now is going to, if, it's, if the input is hello, if the path is hello, it's going to succeed. If the path is not hello, it's going to fail. If it does succeed, it's going to return 200 with a hello. Okay? So that's where the failing thing. So the whole web part, this whole new web part will fail. It's going to, just like with the railway track, it's going to bypass the next um, stage. If the path thing fails, the, the OK will never happen. All right. Now, the next thing is we're going to have two web parts. I'm going to choose between them. So this is the choose web part, and you pass in a list of other web parts, and it basically picks the first web part that succeeds. So if the input is hello, it's going to find the first web part is going to succeed, and it's going to return hello. If the input is goodbye, the first web part is going to fail, and the second web part is going to succeed. And if, the, if none of these succeed, the whole thing is going to fail. All right, so that's a choose. Now, we, now we're building up a web part from smaller web parts, okay? And then we're going to combine it with the get web part. Now, the get web part only succeeds if the input, uh, if the request type is get. So when we say get composed with choose, this whole thing now only works when the input is get. And then we make a complete application. So we're going to choose between get with two cases and post with two cases. So now the input, you know, if the input is post, the whole get thing is going to fail and it's going to drop down to the post. If the get does work, it's going to look at the path and it's either going to be hello or goodbye. If the hello, if it's not hello, it's going to drop down to the goodbye and if that works, it's going to say okay. So this is a complete web application written using web parts, composing web parts together to make bigger and bigger web parts just like the Lego, just like everything else, okay? And then you basically take this web part and you, the entire application takes a web part as input. That is, your application is one giant web part. So, web parts are connectable, just like Lego, okay? You stick two of them together, you get another web part, you get another thing, that's the composition. They're reusable, okay? So the get web part can be reused in many different contexts. The choose web part can be reused in many different contexts. The, the OK web part can be reused in many different contexts. Okay? These are reusable components that can be glued together to make a web app. And this is when you do this, you get your web app that looks something like this. Lots of little functions inside. No classes, no loops, no objects, no methods, just pure <laughs> functions composed together. Okay? The power of composition. Okay, this is the power of composition. So let's review what we, we discussed. We talked about philosophy, the philosophy of composition, things being connectable, not having to use a special kind of adapter, everything being reusable. Okay? That's really the whole philosophy behind composition. This is why it's so important you can do so much with it. We then talked about functional programming, 
Composable functions, composable types. Composable, composable. Everything is composable. You probably get fed up with that word because I've said it so many times. And then we looked at basic composition using angle brackets to compose two functions and piping to chain functions together. Partial application is another technique to help you do composition. And then we talked about monads and using bind and using Kleisley compositions. So all these functional programming techniques like mode and stuff, they're all about composition. It's all about how can I make my life easier? How can I do composition? Okay. So when they, you think, why do they even have monads? Why do they make it so complicated? They're not trying to make it complicated. They're trying to solve a problem which is composing different kinds of things. All right? And you can see that when we do use these techniques, things do become composable. We can turn uncomposable things into composable things. So that's it. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to put the slides uh, on my website, slash composition, and the video will be up in a, a month probably. Uh, if you like this talk, I've got more videos. Um, uh, if you like domain-driven design, you might want to check out my book. There's my book. Uh, at me on Twitter, and if you want to know more about F-Sharp, fsharp.org is the place to go. I highly encourage you to check it out. So thanks very much. If any questions, just come and grab me. Cheers.